away from Friday, and you're about to get up to speed on international events. I'm Carl Azus. First up, Russia has launched its first airstrikes in the Middle Eastern nation of Syria. It's a country where the U.S. has been leading airstrikes for months, and Russia says it has the same target, the ISIS terrorist group. The U.S. officials said yesterday that Russia's airstrikes appear to be in places where ISIS isn't operating. And American leaders are concerned that Russia won't just be targeting ISIS, but fighting any enemies of Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. There are several different sides to Syria's ongoing civil war. One is the Syrian government, which Russia supports, but the U.S. opposes. There are Syrian rebels who are fighting their government. And there are terrorists who want the land for themselves. As Russia joins the conflict through airstrikes, it's telling American aircraft to avoid Syria's airspace while it does. This simply is not an area where ISIS is located, no matter what the Russians say. This is an area where anti-Assad, anti-regime militias have been fighting the Assad government. This, by all indications, is a military strike to prop up the Assad regime. Right now, what the Russians have done is it create an exquisite military problem for U.S. pilots. What has to happen now, officials say, there are going to have to be so-called rules of engagement. If U.S. pilots flying in Syrian airspace, and they will continue to fly, if they encounter Russian aircraft, what are the rules of the road? If they feel threatened, even inadvertently, let's say the Russians are making a mistake, they don't understand it's a U.S. aircraft, what are the rules of the road for U.S. military pilots encountering Russian aircraft? Do they have the right of self-defense? Can they counterattack against the Russians if they feel a threat? These are the questions that the Pentagon wanted to sit down and talk to the Russians about. It was just earlier this week, of course, that President Obama and Russian President Putin said there would be talks between the two militaries to work all of this out. But now the Russians have taken the first step. They've gone ahead and done it. And here at the Pentagon, a lot of unhappiness, to put it mildly, about what the Russians are doing and what may come next. One request a day is the way to put your school in the running for a roll call. The address, cnnstudentnews.com. The Bronx are up first today. Galloping in from Billings, Montana, Billings Senior High School is awesome. Staying out in the West, it's great to see the scouts scouting out a shout out. Laramie Junior High School is in Laramie, Wyoming. And on the shores of the Persian Gulf, we heard from the American International School of Kuwait. It's in the capital, Kuwait City. Over the past few years, we've reported on global temperatures, how scientists say they've been some of the warmest on record. That's one reason why this is such a mystery to researchers. They're calling it a blob, a large area in the North Atlantic that's registering some of its coldest temperatures on record. Don't get this confused with the blob in the Pacific. There's one there too. It's a warm area of that ocean blamed on El Nino, a natural process that extends from the Central Pacific to South America. Scientists don't know what's causing the cold Atlantic blob. One theory is that melting ice in Greenland is bringing down ocean temperatures in the region around it. There's no scientific consensus about whether this blob is related to climate change. Researchers say it appears to be the exact opposite of the El Nino warming on the other side of the hemisphere. Another mystery in the Atlantic Ocean involves a storm named Joaquin. It strengthened into a Category 1 hurricane yesterday. It's expected to hit the Bahamas today, so preparations are being made for that. But where will it go afterward? Here's one forecast model. It shows Hurricane Joaquin spinning north, roughly parallel to the U.S. East Coast. But meteorologists don't have a lot of confidence in this. Some say it could turn west and hit North Carolina. Some say it could turn east and spin out to sea. The last major storm to make landfall in the eastern U.S. was Hurricane Arthur in 2014. Where are we getting these storm names? If you lived in Homestead, Florida in 1992, Andrew is a name you will never forget. Just like in 2005, if you lived in the New Orleans area, Katrina. The military started naming storms after their wives, their girlfriends, but none of these names were made public. So in 1950, everything changed. Several storms formed out in the Atlantic about the same time. It created a lot of confusion. So the U.S. Weather Bureau said, okay, let's start naming storms. And they actually started by using the World War II alphabet. Able, 
Faker, Charlie, Dog, Easy, but this created confusion as well because every year the storm names were the same. It wasn't until 1979 that we started alternating male and female names. We recycle that list every six years. In the Atlantic Basin, we use English, Spanish, and French names. No storms are named after a particular person. In fact, you can't request a storm to be named after you. That entire process is handled by the World Meteorological Organization. A storm name will be retired if it is too costly or deadly and it would be inappropriate to use it in future years. In fact, since 1950, there have been nearly 80 storm names retired. And what happens if we go through all of the storm names? Well, it happened in 2005. We ended up going to the Greek alphabet. So that's what's in a name. It took a long time to get here, but just like each individual name, each storm tends to have its own personality. If you're ever investigating fingerprints at a crime scene, you better hope there were no koala bears involved. Why? Because they have fingerprints, y'all, and they're a koala lot like ours. Even under a microscope, the fingerprints of koala bears strongly resemble those of people. So maybe it was Colonel Mustard in the library with the candlestick, or maybe it was the koala. Now that's random. James Langevin is one of the 435 voting members of the U.S. House of Representatives. He's one of the two representatives from Rhode Island. Langevin's a member of the House Armed Services Committee. He's prioritized issues like national security, cybersecurity, and health care. But it's what he's overcome to get where he is that makes him today's character study. 16-year-old James Langevin was volunteering at a local police station when an officer's gun accidentally discharged. The bullet ricocheted off a locker, is what I'm told and the, the bullet went through my neck and, and severed my spinal cord. Langevin was paralyzed from the waist down and has limited mobility in his arms. The question I had right from the get-go, how am I going to live uh, any kind of a meaningful life going forward? But Langevin did just that. He attended college, went on to Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, and was elected a Democratic congressman for the state of Rhode Island. Motivated, he says, by his own desire to prove the naysayers wrong. I would hear the, well, you're a nice guy, but, you know, this is a rough business. Maybe you're better off doing something else. You know, it's always when you tell me I can't do something that, you know, I'll find a way. He did find a way. On the 20th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act, Langevin made history. For the first time in our country's history, a gentleman with the challenges that Mr. Langevin faces is presiding as Speaker of the House of Representatives. I hope that the, the people can look at me and say, you know, here's a guy with tremendous challenges and difficulties, but somehow he, he's made it. Before we go, you might not think a cat and an owl would get along very well, especially because the cat's a cat and the owl's an owl. But believe it or not, these two are BFFs. They hang out, they play, they don't attack each other. The cat sometimes nuzzles the owl while the bird preens the cat. Who says a feline and a bird of prey can't get along? Now, if they could just find a way to go hunting together, whether they stalk it or wing it, there's no food fast enough to outfast or outlast this fascinating friendship. We've got to be going, but I'll be back tomorrow and hope you'll hunt for us again at cnnstudentnews.com.